This is a great honor for me to be able to come up and talk about Russ Okawa. Russ, for those of you who knew him or thought you knew him, he was a man who basically throughout his life served other people. Whether it was with his church, whether it was with his bike shop, whether it was with his racing team, or later on in life, whether it was with his uh, cohorts at Giant, that's what he was that's what really made him a man. And he was a great person. I, I'm very honored to do this. So right now I would like you to be able to look at this video that they're gonna start right now, and I'll say a few words afterwards. Hit it, please. I was working at a, uh, at a Schwinn bicycle shop and uh, the introduction to BMX kind of came through a bunch of kids that used to hang around at the, uh, at the store. And uh, they used to talk about these bicycle races at Indian Dunes Park after the mini cycle races on Sunday. And they kept saying, hey, you know, we should go out there and race. Why don't you guys take us? So a couple of us uh, said, sure. So we got together on Sunday afternoon. We drove out to Indian Dunes Park. Um, and they used to race bicycles on the minicycle course there. And, uh, you know, that was uh, the, the kids that were there with their parents riding motorcycles or whatever would just hang around. They'd hang around for the extra 45 minutes it took to, to run the bicycle races. So that was kind of what got me hooked. Uh, we went out, saw what the kids were riding, and, and the 100 yards straight away, and then the turn, um, it's like, this is ridiculous because all you need to do is change your gear and do this and do that to your bike and you'll blow everybody away. So at that time, there was Rick's Bike Shop and there was the Canoga Cycle Center team. And uh, those of us that hung out at the races, that would go to the races, that would work on the bikes, we were, I guess officially, we were trained bicycle mechanics. So whatever that may, means officially. Uh, it, we, we had some mechanical background in terms of operation of the bike, how to fix them, how they worked, how to make them efficient. One by one, we, as we started to go out there, we geared the bikes up. Um, the first time we went out, the guys had the high gear, were laid off the line, but as soon as you got your stride, blew everybody away. We modified a three-speed coaster brake hub and locked out one of the gears and we set up a bike with what we call the two-speed clutch. And then they had the start advantage and then they'd click it into high gear and take off. That was kind of fun. There was nothing illegal about it and ultimately as we started to progress in the next year or two, uh, we did go to places where they said, oh, you cannot race a two-speed. And they basically blocked us out because you know, you were just winning all the time. I don't know how, if all of you knew Russ or knew of Russ, but if you didn't know, I'll let you know, Russ passed on earlier, right at the beginning of this year. So this is a little bit of a difficult in, uh, induction right here to introduce somebody who's, you know, passed on. but. I hate to say it, it's almost fitting because every year when Russ knew that the Hall of Fame was coming up, man, Russ would know that he's on the ballot and, you know, all, you know we would talk, he would vote for Russ and he's like, no, 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 somebody else should go in and that was just how he was. So, I mean, it was, it's, I'm very sad, obviously, that he's passed on, but it's just like a perfect time for him to, to go in because it, truly, in his heart, this is how he would have wanted it. 
Russ started off an employee, then he worked into a manager position at a shop, Canoga Cycle Center, owned by the Straub family, Bert Straub and his family. And Russ was working there. I had a story that I was just talking to a guy last week, and the guy that I was talking to, he was a haunch rider in his day. Some of you may know him. His name is Mel Stoutzenberger. You may see some pictures of the guy. The guy was a phenomenal rider, but when he was young, he had a Schwinn Continental 10-speed that he bought from Canoga Cycle Center, got a flat one day, goes bumping into Russ's shop. Russ is, and he's like, hey, I got to figure out how to patch this tire. Russ goes, well, you want to, you know, look and f figure it out? And Mel's like, yeah, yeah. So Russ, I kind of shows him. Russ sees that Mel has some mechanical intuition. And so he says, hey, you want to hang around and maybe do some stuff, clean up, maybe start changing some tires. And there's a bunch of guys up in the valley riding. And one of his buddies was a guy named Alan Johnson. The kids used to call him AJ. Mel's on his, uh, his Continental. The Continental, I don't know if that, it's, it's a, mount, a road bike, but it's got a high flange front hub. And anyhow, so the, hey, this guy, AJ, he says, hey, you know what? I think it'd be cool to have a wheel laced with that high flange front hub and a heavy duty wheel on it because all the Schwinn bikes, and that's what everybody was riding then, had a little skinny front hub and 28 spoke wheels. And if you jumped it, you bent it. And anyhow, so. Mel goes back, tells Russ, and says, hey, Russ, can we build this wheel? And Russ goes, well, I don't know. And he looks in this big-ass Schwinn book of parts and stuff, and he finds this Continental high flange hub and with a rear rim 36 spoke. And, you know, he goes, yeah, I can do it. He figures out what the spoke length is, and they build this wheel, and they give it to this guy, Alan Johnson. He goes out riding, and Mel's there working at the shop, and all of a sudden these kids are bumping in going, hey, dude, I want a wheel like AJ's. I want a wheel like AJ's. And... Pretty soon, there's, you know, they sell one, they sell two. Next thing you know, they're, they're selling five wheels. They're selling ten wheels. And by this time, you know, Russ is kind of recruiting a, father, a few other of Mel's buddies. And, you know, so it kind of turns into almost like a little bit of a production line. They had stacks and stacks of these wheels. And because this guy was AJ, was his, uh, you know, what they called him. All of a sudden, Russ starts stamping in the hubs, AJ1, AJ2, AJ3. So they had a bunch of kids working over there. So Russ kind of brought all these kids and showed them. And so pretty soon there's, there's, there's races going on. You saw Indian Dunes. The two big tracks were Indian Dunes and Malibu BMX. So Russ takes a few kids out like one week. One other thing about Russ kind of is like he would also be involved in his church and taking kids out in his, in his uh, family station wagon to different like church activities. So it wasn't just the BMX races. But they go out to the BMX races and, they, and they're stuffing kids in there. And I guess by the second or the third race, I mean, it was just like you couldn't fit an extra person or an extra bike in there. They had so many people stuffed in there. In the bike shop that I worked at, I worked at a Schwinn shop, most of the kids that came into the store rode Schwinn, Schwinn bikes, Schwinn stingrays. And so I think the first time we went to this Indian Dunes deal um, to look across the field, and, and see Huffies and Raleigh's and just a mishmash of bikes out there. And, and at that point in the hierarchy of cycling and company names, Schwinn was probably at its peak in terms of brand recognition and uh, probably being synonymous with cycling in the world. So when you went to an event like that with this assortment of bikes, it's like, ooh, you got a Schwinn bike. That was the premier bike to own, especially to show up on a race on if you were competitive. You know, oh wow, Schwinn Stingray. At that point, there was a certain amount of, uh, well, who, who are these guys where every kid has a Schwinn? These guys are the Schwinn team, and, and we got that reputation. So once that identity started to congeal, kind of come out of the fog, it's like, wouldn't it be cool if we all had shirts that said Canoga Cycle Center Schwinn Team? We went down that path and we got, we got shirts and we got a budget from the bike shop owner and uh, we got a checking account. So that was also impressive to, to go to a race and stand in the, uh, in the line with all the parents that are paying their cash and come up and write a check. To, to any event, actually, and be able to write a, a check for your entry forms. From, the, uh, from a bike shop or from an official team. Uh, the team that we had parlayed together as the Canoga Cycle Center team ultimately became the core for the official Schwinn team, which was actually put together not by Schwinn Bicycle, the bicycle division, but their parts division. 
and it was actually Skip Hess, the inventor and founder of Motomag and Mongoose, that actually connected me with the Schwinn Parts Division people, where we basically turned that first um, Schwinn team on, and through that group and the NBA, Ernie and Suzanne, uh, the first NBA slash Schwinn tour happened. Basically, Eddie King summed it up really well. He, when we were talking when Russ passed, you know, he said, you know, I think every kid racer in the San Fernando Valley got helped out by Russ Okawa. And I think that was a pretty good statement, and that was probably pretty true. When I came on, I knew of Russ from, you know, building stuff at, at Canoga Cycle Center, but he was also a photographer. And there's tons of photographs from the early days probably quite a few of them that are in that Hall of Fame that Russ took. When Schwinn finally did come to their senses and figure, wow, BMX might be something, they started Team Schwinn. And who was the first guy that helped out organize it? Russ. Hadley was on it, Eric and Robbie Roop, uh, Chucky Hood, Kevin Jackson, Mark Pippen was on it, uh, Ted Gilmetti, um, and then I think they brought on Donnie Atherton and afterwards, but they did that. Russ was involved in that in the first team Schwinn. Later on in his career, he went on to work with Mongoose because even though Schwinn was the behemoth of bicycle companies, Mongoose was really the, the BMX company. And then in the mid 80s, the BMX was kind of dying down, not necessarily dying down, but it was a little bit. He, I don't know that he was working with Mongoose. Mongoose changed hands. So Russ left the BMX scene, but he never left the BMX world. In fact, one of the things that he did when he was working with one of his company, Saxe, he had some of his BMX uh, partners. One of them was John Tomac. And John Tomac was a very good BMX racer, but when it was, he kind of, you know, explained that he wanted to get into mountain bike racing. Russ helped him out, kind of tricked his bike out a little bit. You know, I remember Tomac's first bike, it was a Mongoose. 24 inch wheeled BMX cruiser that you know him and Byron threw some gears on in the back and then Russ helped him trick it out a little bit. Next thing you know, Tomac's getting to go to the races and he's starting to win some stuff and he gets a full on sponsorship with Mongoose. Russ helped that out right there. Because I always knew Russ but I was never really hooked up with him till let's say the last 10 years when he came over at Giant. Skip Hess came on, not Skip Big Skip that started Mongoose, but his son. And Skip Hess came to be the bus driver over at Giant. He was the one in charge. And he always wanted to bring guys on that were like, he could trust, he could count on. And Russ fit both of those bills. You know, so it wasn't, it, Skip was probably on for like three weeks before Russ was on with us. And it was, it, it, it was a great partnership, you know. Um, Nobody would beat Russ to work. I mean, if you got there at 6 o'clock, he'd be like, good morning, with the coffee already gone. You know, I mean, it was great. You know, I mean, it, you know, I, we would go to different events. I mean, because, you know, work in the bike industry does have its perks. You get to go to mountain bike races. You get to go to different things. Russ is always there. And that's when I really got to realize how lucky his team riders actually were. Because he would have orange juice. He would have food. You know, I mean, he loved to cook, you know, I mean, God, it was great when he would have like, you know, there. I work at Giant, but I don't work inside a Giant, but I would always hear that when he would be, you know, when they would have like a big party, Russ would bring something and his food would always get devoured. And I think I'll leave this with one of my best days. And, you know, you, you have a lot of best days, you know, your marriage, your birth of your children and all that. But aside from that, I mean, we had a... Uh, a sales meeting at Giant and after that sales meeting a few of us reps hung around uh, because we had a big customer coming in early part of next week so we'd stay the weekend and then we would stay there to do a big presentation and that weekend was Super Bowl Sunday and that day started off with me we got up early meet a few guys got we golfed nine holes came back and a few other guys were ready we went for this killer mountain bike ride and then afterwards we were all going to Russ's house and he was making food and we we're going to watch the Super Bowl and we got there and he had all this you know the food set up he has a in his house he had a wall full of schnapps I mean he loved to drink that stuff and it was just a great night and I remember thinking to the guys that I was like oh you know what this is one of the five best days of my life and Russ's house and Russ's hospitality was part of it. So it's with great honor that I want to present Russ Okawa into the National BMX Hall of Fame.
Good evening. Thanks, Perry. You are welcome. I don't know how to follow that up. Um, I am Karen, one of Russell's four siblings, and um, his junior by six years. And we're all here tonight. My whole family, we're taking up about a table and a half. We're really happy to be here. Yeah! Yeah! Thank you. Great. There we go. Okay. Okay. Um, so anyway, this is a great celebration, and it's a fantastic way, personally, for my family to remember Russell um, at this ADA BMX Hall of Fame induction ceremony. This is wonderful. We're glad to be here. Uh, Russell was always into bicycles. I remember when I was junior high school age, um, locking on to Russell's excitement as he talked about the goings on at the Schwinn bike shop in Canoga Park where he worked, that Perry talked about. Um, he would have been 17 or 18 at that time. And I recall like the conviction and intensity with which he challenged Schwinn's admonishment about the dangers of this new motocross sport and dirt biking and particularly the risks of racing with Schwinn stingrays. Um, what if someone should get hurt? Uh, what about all those the high incidence of stingray frame replacements there in Southern California? Uh, but I loved listening to all that. Um, half the time I honestly didn't know what he was talking about. You know, what was truing a wheel? And um, was there such a thing as a false tire? You know, I didn't know. But I still love to listen to him talk about that. Uh, later I recall how excited I was and how cool it was to open up the New York Times and see a full page spread of Russell's photographs. It was black and white, it was big, high speed, a little bit grainy, bicycle action photo with a caption that said, uh, photo by Russell Kawa. He was really proud of that and we were too. And after Russell's death, we found a file folder in one of the file cabinets that had some copies of correspondence between Russ and Schwinn Bicycle Company. And I wanted to share one of the letters with you. I thought it was pretty interesting. This was around 1973, and those 73 and those early 70s years were um, pretty pivotal transition years for the bicycle industry and for BMX in particular, as, as I understand it. Um, and I like to think that he saved those letters because he also understood uh, that the nature of um, bicycling and, and competitive racing was going to be indelibly changed. This is a letter from Russ. He typed it in July 1973, and he sent it to Schwinn Corporate Office in Chicago. He was uh, 22 at the time that he wrote this letter. It's a long letter, and it's a, a detailed serial exposition in Russ's typical fashion. Um, he tells Schwinn that there's a problem with a certain knobby tire uh, forcing off-center rear-wheel placement to avoid rubbing between the tire and the chain. Um, he warns them about tires coming back to the shop with torn sideballs after just one day of use. He's giving feedback regarding Schwinn's informational film where Schwinn states that their rims are carefully deburred before chroming. And um, Russ has a different observation. So I quote here. Let's see. Our shop just received its new quote-unquote perfect assistant projection system. After viewing the film cartridge titled Quality, I have only one comment. Bullshit. <laughs> I, I don't know if Schwinn ever addressed that problem. <laughs> but tonight I would like to say that my family is really honored that the illustrious BMX community has chosen amidst 
what looks like stiff competition and uh, so many talented and deserving persons uh, to esteem Russell's memory with this BMX Hall of Fame award. Uh, Russ would have been really thrilled. He would have said he's really, really thrilled uh, to be recognized as a standout in his industry uh, by his peers. He would have considered this a toast-worthy event, probably worth at least a couple rounds of uh, grappa, or maybe even something that tastes better. Um, but anyway, this is a wonderful tribute. So on behalf of my brother Russ and my family, uh, I would like to say cheers and thank you for this honor. Thank you very much. <laughs>